Good morning, Cornerstone Baptist Church. Grateful that you're with us in this capacity today. We are definitely missing you at the outdoor uh, service and potluck, but we understand it's summer and vacation and people are traveling and a variety of different things uh, with COVID and whatnot. So uh, just praying for you today, missing you. I'm looking forward to, to another time where we can be together. Uh, this morning we're going to look at Psalm 84, uh, and this is just a beautiful, beautiful psalm. Uh, it's one that Spurgeon called the Pearl of the Psalms. And as I read over it and read over it and started thinking through it, um, it really again is another psalm that comes across as a like a love song uh, to God. And I started to to think a little bit about where have I heard a song, songs like this before. Uh, there are a lot of them, but I think for me, the one that really, really connected is a is an old song. I, I'm a very eclectic when it comes to music. Um, and so I went back to big band kind of uh, times and uh, a song that really came from a musical, My Fair Lady, uh, but it was called On the Street Where You Live. So I'm going to read it a couple um, sections of it. And then we're going to get into Psalm 84 and kind of see how these two things connect, or at least these two ideas connect a little bit. So, on the street where you live, I have often walked down the street before, but the pavement always stayed beneath my feet before. All at once, I'm several stories high, knowing it's just on the street where you live. Are there lilac trees in the heart of town? Can you hear a lark in any other part of town? Does enchantment pour out of every door? No, it's on the street where you live. And oh, the towering feeling just to know somehow you are near. Uh, the overpowering feeling that any second you may appear. And I definitely got this vibe from reading and studying Psalm 84 that the, um, this wasn't a Psalm of David. It was a Psalm of Korah. Uh, the the sons of Korah, and I definitely got the feel that uh, what's being communicated throughout this psalm is just because of my relationship with you, because of what you have done, because of who you are, uh, every place uh, is beautiful. Uh, every place is lovely, um, and it's because you're there. And again, that's a very popular uh, theme throughout uh, music, uh, love songs. And again, I think that's something we struggle with is to put our relationship with God into a love relationship language. But I think that'll be one of the challenges um, this, maybe this week, is to write a love song, to, to write a love prayer to God after we get done uh, with looking at Psalm 84. Uh, so we're just going to go a couple verses at a time, just like we have um, all summer. Psalm 84, 1 through 2. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. And again, there's that theme, uh, right? It, it, how lovely is your dwelling place, God? And again, it's not because, I mean, it's not because it just the heaven or wherever uh, the, the psalmist is talking about isn't beautiful, but it's, it's that idea that because I'm in relationship with you, these places just seem uh, amazing. It's lovely. It's beautiful. It blows me away. And again, maybe you can think back to kind of like that song, like moments in your life where you're just caught up in who you're with, right? In a relationship. Uh, you're caught up with who they are. Uh, you're caught up with this person is with me and this person loves me. And it makes even the average, like the song said, even the average street explodes because of 
our relationship because we're in relationship together. And that's the feel I get here in the opening is that um, the psalmist is saying, this place is lovely. Uh, Your dwelling place is lovely. You make any place you dwell lovely and breathtaking because of who you are. Being where you are, God makes all the difference. And I just think we need to ponder that for a minute. Uh, We'll look here in a little bit at some specific ways we can look at that. Um, But that's that's an important thought um, that we need to kind of wrap our heads around a little bit. Um, I also um, noticed as I looked at these two verses that the psalmist kind of uses the trinity of a person. Um, in this, in verse 2. My soul longs, soul longs and faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing to the joy of the living God. So there's three aspects of humanity that are tied into this, and I think that's the psalmist's way of saying, like, I'm all in. I am all in and totally committed to this relationship, fully invested um, from the from my very soul all the way to my flesh, God, I want to be in complete and total relationship with you. Uh, the other thing I noticed about these two verses is uh, the communication of who God is, uh, the words that the psalmist uses, right? Lord of hosts, which is used another time in this passage. And again, we've talked about this before in our um looking through Psalms, is the idea the Lord of hosts is the God who commands angel armies. Host is this military term that's a number that is uncountable, right? And our God, this God in whom we have a relationship with and whom changes every place that he dwells, uh, is the God who commands angel armies. And that's... That's what the psalmist is using to communicate who God is. The other thing uh, that the psalmist uh, uses for God is living God. And so here the psalmist is saying, like, we don't serve an idol. We don't serve a God who doesn't respond. Uh, We don't serve a God who is impersonal. Our God is the living God. He is alive. Uh, He seeks relationship with us. Uh, And we should seek relationship with us with this very living God. He's intimately involved in our lives. Um, And the psalmist feels like that is a very important point uh, that needs to be considered. And as I thought about this, I thought about a couple different ways we can look at really these verses and really this whole psalm. We can look at it from an Old Testament perspective. We can look at it from a New Testament perspective. Uh, or a gospel perspective, and then a New Testament perspective. Uh, In particular, one word I want to do that in this section with, and that's the word dwelling. See, dwelling is this really important word, or dwell. Uh, In the Old Testament, uh, where really that word means literally the word that was used for tabernacle, okay? And so dwelling means tabernacle. Uh, Tabernacle was the place where the people saw the presence of God come down. And this is in particular, the tabernacle was constructed as the people came out of Egypt. And so it was this building that would stay in the center of camp and move with the people and have to be set up uh, multiple times, but it was always at the center, uh, right? And so in the Old Testament, the tabernacle eventually became the temple, the place where God's dwelling uh, could be seen by the people. It's where he would meet with leaders like Moses. Um, And so keep in mind, uh, that's the idea that the psalmist is thinking about. He's thinking about this in an Old Testament perspective. But again, the beauty of God's word, God's living word, is that as this psalmist was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, It very much makes sense in a gospel sort of way 
and in a New Testament sort of way for us today. So the gospel connection uh, to this word dwelling or tabernacle um, connects to John 1, 14, uh, which says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. And the beauty of that is um, that God's presence now in the Gospels is not um, just in and seen in the temple and in the tabernacle, um, but it's seen in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is the Word in John 1. And so the beauty of the Gospels, the beauty of Jesus, is that He dwelt among us. He tabernacled with us. He came. God didn't just stay. Again, think about living God again. God didn't just stay in the heavens or stay away. He came near. He dwelt with us in a gospel sort of way. And then the next, the next step is to look at this from a New Testament perspective, this idea of dwelt. Um, and there's really two verses that came to mind as I was thinking about this is uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and Romans 8, 9. We're going to be in Romans a lot, Romans 8 a lot today, a couple more times. But um, in a New Testament sort of way, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God, you are not your own, you are bought with a price. And so now, in a New Testament sort of way, in a, in a today sort of way, God dwells in us. He tabernacles in us. Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. And so through the Holy Spirit, we become the vessels that God dwells in. And so I love being able to look at that. I love being able to see how this was written in an Old Testament setting and that that word dwelt would have connected with the people to be the tabernacle and the temple and the, the very human places that were built for God, for God. And then to see Jesus come, and for them to use that word, dwelt. He dwelt with us. God came near. And then to experience this in a New Testament sort of way, to say, Jesus left, and He said, it's better for me to leave so that the Helper comes, because the Helper's going to dwell in you believer and so what I what I one of my random thoughts when I was thinking about this is what that communicates about who we are like all of this is done for the glory of God but but what does the psalm say about us when we look at it from a New Testament perspective and so I just go back to verse 1 how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. What is that saying about us as we are the dwelling place of God? Because God is who He is, we maybe bring Him glory and honor, but because He chooses through His Spirit to dwell in us, does that not make us this, this dwelling place of God? Lovely, And we're going to see in a, in a later verses here how that, that idea, I think, comes around again. Um, but for those that are struggling with worth and value and dignity and looking at it in a worldly sort of way, like, I don't really have worth. Like, Christian, you have worth because not only were you created by God that gives you that worth, but... Also, you are the dwelling place of God. You are lovely because of who dwells in you. And that's, I think, something that we need to think about. 
Like, does this world notice us and therefore notice God because of how lovely we are, because of how lovely God is through us as we walk in this world? Does the world see us exuding joy? Because that's part of verse 2, right? And my soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Because I have so much joy, does this world look at me and say, there's something different about that person. There's something so lovely about that person. And we have the opportunity to say, no, it's not me. It's because the Spirit of God is dwelling in me. And what you're seeing is the effects of God dwelling in me in me does the world see us exuding love and joy in all situations because we are the dwelling place of god may we think on that may that be something you carry away and and let marinate in your mind this week you are lovely because God is dwelling in you. And are you showing that naturally to the world? Psalms 84, 3 and 4. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house ever singing your praise. And so I think there's a continuation of, again, that thought about uh, loveliness and how God views um, this world. But the sparrow and the swallow, uh, the sparrow in particular, these are birds that uh, in Scripture were kind of often used as the castaway, like the, to signify lowliness so to speak, okay? Um, in, the, in the sacrificial system, the sparrow was um, used specifically for the poor because they were cheap. Um, it was something that the poor people could afford to bring a sacrifice to God. Um, and so again, there's almost a sense in Scripture where it's, you know, the sparrow and the swallow represent kind of the, the bottom end, you know, like worthless almost um, as far as the world is concerned. Okay? Um, in Matthew 10, Jesus said, are, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And that's Matthew 10, 29 through 31. And so I don't think, you know, Jesus is saying that the sparrow is worthless, but I think he's using that as a human, like the world views this as a worthless small thing. But I'm telling you, God looks at that and says, I'm aware of that. And not one of them is going to fall without his say-so, without his plan. Uh, and he's kind of saying, aren't you, even, aren't you worth more than many of these sparrows? So if I know this, what do I know about you? What am I planning for you? And, and so I think this is a message, to, a, a message to those who feel like the sparrow, right? That feel like the swallow. That feel, you know, I'm viewed as worthless. I'm not important. In this world, as far as the world's economy is concerned, I am zero. I am worthless, right? No one's too worthless or too far gone to dwell with God and God to dwell with them. And again, what happens according to those first verses when God dwells in us? We become lovely. We are the dwelling place of God. We have immediate worth and value because of who resides in us. The world may say, you're worthless. Some churches or some church people 
may say, you're too far gone. You've done too much. You're not welcome here. You're worthless. But God says, come find your dwelling with me. Come back to me. You are priceless in my sight. Let me dwell with you. And so Christian, when, when you dwell with God and He with you, you're blessed and you have immense worth. Lost one, when you choose to come to Jesus like the lost sheep, when, when He finds you and He brings you near, uh, you are blessed and you have immense worth to the shepherd of your soul. And so there's, there's no one. The, the door's wide open. You're not unimportant to God. Uh, Psalm 84, 5-7. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. And so a continuation here of the idea of when we dwell with God and He dwells with us, we have this strength. We, we have this strength that comes from... It's not from us. It's not something that we can generate. It's clearly a strength that He gives us in our weakness. And again, Paul talks about that. Right? The beauty of God being strong through weak vessels. Right? It happens when we choose to dwell with God and God with us. When we seek and we strive to be close to Him and to know His ways, uh, He blesses us and others. That's what this verse says. It's amazing. Uh, even when we travel through difficulty, right? So this whole idea of the Valley of Baca is this place of no water, this desert. As we're traveling and journeying through our life, what's awesome about this verse is it says, because again, we are the dwelling place of God. Kind of read this in a New Testament sort of way. When we go through these valleys and we go through these deserts and places of no water, um, God can use us to bless this bless our surroundings and bless those in our surroundings. Look at what it says. As they go through this valley of no water, they make it a place of springs. Why? Because we're magic? No, because God dwelling in us blesses those around us. And I know, you know, we've been through valleys and deserts and rough times are you using what you what god has taught you what you have learned in your valleys to bless other people uh, are you bringing cool water to people stuck in the desert because you've been there at one point in your life and god is using that trial using that struggle uh, to bless other people and to strengthen other people right to share that he gives us strength for the journey of difficulty, right? You've got the journey of difficulty that He's going to strengthen you through as you choose to dwell in Him. But you also know He's going to give you the strength for the journey of joy. So whatever journey you're on, whatever leg of the journey you're on, we know He's going to give us our strength because we're choosing to dwell with Him and He with us. He gives us that strength. Are we seeking a relationship? Are we seeking that relationship with God? And are we using the blessing of that dwelling relationship to bless others in our world? Are we looking around in our community, in our corner, at our workplace, at our school to bless other people with how we're being blessed in this dwelling relationship? Psalm 84, 8 through 9. O oh Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O oh God. Look on the face of your anointed. So here, the psalmist uses two references to God. 
God of Jacob and God of hosts, again, is mentioned here as a beginning, as the psalmist plea. He's using these two terms, right? So God of angels, angel armies, God of God that controls it all. God of ultimate protection, right? Hear my prayer. Uh, and then the God of Jacob is God of my ancestors, God of God who has been faithful throughout time to me and my people. Give me your ear. Hear me. And so it's beautiful to see the psalmist use these two really deep picture type words to connect with God. Um, and then his prayer is behold our shield. So this is kind of interesting. It kind of caused me for a moment to scratch my head. So what is the shield piece? Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. So as I studied and looked, this, this idea of behold our shield, the shield was often used as a reference to God's chosen king. And so here in this moment, um, as, as the people are traveling in community or as they're praying on, on their own, they're lifting up their leadership. They're praying, uh, behold our shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed. This is the person that you have brought into leadership. Would you bless them? Would you un see their face? Lift them up. Give them wisdom. And uh, that just kind of smacked me in the face a little bit when I, when I came about it because, you know, there's a lot of, in our world today, uh, we really get sucked into the, the politics of everything, the, the critiquing of our leaders. Uh, and again, whichever side of the aisle you fall on. And my question to myself was kind of like, am I really praying enough for my local leaders? Am I really praying enough for my state leaders? Am I really praying that God would bless and that God would strengthen, that God would bring wisdom to my national leader, to my state leaders, and to my local leaders. Uh, so there's a prayer here for that. And again, I just think that needs to be heard today. Like, are you stopping to pause to pray for those people? As much as we want to criticize, are we praying? Are we lifting them up for God to bless them? And then it ends here with Psalms 84, 10 through 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And so again, we see that theme that we started out with, right? That um, the place where you are. I want to be where you are, God, because I want to be in relationship with you and you make every place breathtaking and amazing, right? One day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere, right? Like, and then he goes a step further and says, I'd rather be the lowest, right? The doorkeeper was a servant or someone in a very low position. I'd rather be low and working for you than what's the alternative, right? This tent of wickedness. And it's the idea that you're just chilling. You're relaxing and there's ease in the tent of wickedness, right? And so what's the direction of our heart today? Are we set up towards this love of relaxation and ease? I know I fall into that. Uh, no matter the cost, I'm going to choose ease. I'm going to choose re relaxation. And from a couple weeks ago, Psalm 51, we know that's where David started out his trouble. It's not that taking a moment, uh, some moments to relax and enjoy life is a problem, but but prolonged moments, right, of seeking relaxation and ease leads us to places that we 
don't want to go. We saw that in the life of David. And so here, this tent of wickedness is this idea of ease, relaxation, just chilling, kicking with your, kicking your feet up and relaxing. Like, so is that my heart's desire? Is that where I want to go? Do I want to live in the lap of luxury so that I can live a life of ease, no matter what the cost, right? So wickedness kind of tends to think that this isn't something gained with integrity. It's something that was gained inappropriately. So is that the direction of our heart? Or is our heart to be like, God, I just want to, I want to be near you. So I'm just jazzed to, to hold the door. I'm just jazzed to serve you because again, like my love for you is greater than seeing that as a job. My love for you overshadows anything. And just kind of think again in that romantic love sort of way. Like you can go back there. You can remember uh, if you're not currently at that place. But, you know, I remember moving heaven and earth. to do something amazing uh, for my girlfriend who became my fiance, who's now my wife. Like, it didn't seem like a big deal. It didn't seem like a lot of money to do that. It didn't seem like an amazing grand gesture because it was from a heart of complete and total love. Like, I want this woman to understand how much I love her. And that's the, that's the lingo here is that like holding a door and being this low position, if it means I'm near you, God, I want that. I just want to be near you because better is one day holding a door than a thousand elsewhere in, in, the, in the lap of luxury, in the tent of wickedness. Is that your heart today? Is there anything like just... Think about the practical outcomes of that. As we, as a church, as we start to grow, uh, we're going to need people to do different things, to help, uh, to lead, to hold a door, to welcome people. Right? Is, is your love relationship with God so much that you're like, man, I just want people to experience what I'm experiencing. Uh, I want people to see this joy that's coming out of me because I am the dwelling place of God. And so I'll hold a door. I'll hold a baby. I'll do whatever to serve this God. So that's something I think we all need to, to think about and process. Stop seeing things as chores, but see, I'll move heaven and earth, God, to be near you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Okay. Um. And I love the next section here, right? Uh, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. And so I grabbed onto that sun idea. And and we keep what we love right at the center of our lives, right? And, and, And our lives really rotate around it, just like the sun. So what's at the center of your life? Kind of like we just said with with that, because the psalmist is saying, my love for you Dwelling with you, being near you is at the center of my life. Like little things like holding a door or servant type things, they don't matter. They don't seem like a servant sort of job to me because you're at the center of my life. So is God your son? Is God at the center? Is everything you're doing rotating around God? Or maybe what we talked about, comfort, ease, family, job. Is that what's rotating? Is that what you're rotating around? Uh, Is God your shield? That was the other thing he talked about. So in this sense, it's saying, are you mentally picking up that shield every day? Are you mentally praying for the protection of God, knowing that he's sovereign over everything that you do? When we make him the center, our all in all, when we make him our protection and we pick up that shield, he gives us favor and honor. It says, and then he says, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And and that's connected to all that we just talked about. We walk uprightly when God is at the center. Uh, When we have this dwelling relationship, this active relationship with God. 
uh, when we seek right the spirit of god to be at the center of our life the center of our life is the spirit of jesus christ right and we have that love relationship we can we do all that we can we arrange our lives around loving and caring for the focus of our love right and that's this relationship we have with the holy spirit with jesus with god and so i do want to point out that it says good thing right and so my mind went again to romans 8 right it says no good thing will he withhold in this psalm from those who walk uprightly in romans 8 28 says we know this one and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that we, that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so the good, good in there is this idea, we often know 28, but we don't bring in 29. And 29 tells us that the good that he's talking about in 28, that God's going to work all this out for good. The good and the bad is all going to be worked out in our lives for good. And what's the ultimate good? My definition of good sometimes is different than what God's is. In 29, he says that the good is that we are conformed to the image of his son, we look more like Jesus. And so God is going to give us good and bad things for the purpose of making us more like Jesus. Okay. We have to keep in mind that he's going to do these things, the good and what we would call bad, for his glory and our good, that we look more like Jesus. And keep this in mind. This is another Psalm, not Psalm, Romans 8 thought again. If if God did this good thing to us in calling us, in making us his dwelling place, and he was able to do that because his son came and dwelt among us, lived this perfect life that we couldn't live, died for the sins that were ours, rose again and now that the holy spirit dwells in us if he did that for us what good thing wouldn't he give us and that's a, a romans eight thirty one again what then shall we say to these things if god is for us who can be against us he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also with him graciously give us all things and i think there's an element here in that verse no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly you know and what's your view of god like i think yeah he's going to give good and bad but i think we look at god sometimes with lightning bolts ready to throw at us as soon as we make a mistake instead of hands full of blessing like waiting waiting to give us a good gift waiting to bless us and that's the picture i get here is that no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly as we keep him at the center as we live in this dwelling relationship with god like he's looking to give us good things good things and sometimes again we'll have rough and bad moments but the beauty of the the passage is that He's going to use that to make me more like Jesus. And that's such a beautiful, beautiful promise, beautiful thing. So some challenges for you today. Uh, number one, does your soul long and faint to be with God? Are you truly dwelling with him? And I'm just going to throw it out there. Write a sappy love letter to God. It'll make you uncomfortable, but it's good for us to be uncomfortable sometimes. Right? Use romantic language. Steal a song, maybe, or a poem, and use that um, in your sappy love song slash prayer to God. And see what that does for you. Two, uh, do we have an all-are-welcomed attitude? 
Right? Worth is decided by who God dwells with. And He seeks to dwell within us all. He's pursuing you. He's pursuing others. Are you welcoming those people in? Three, as you journey through the ups and the downs of life, as you go through joyful moments, as you go through the valley of Baca, right? The valley of no water. Are you looking for God to bless others through you because you are his dwelling place? Are you bringing water to the desert? Are you allowing God to bring water to the desert through you? And then do you picture a God looking to bless or a God looking to throw lightning bolts at the mistakes that you made? How do you see God? No good thing does he withhold for those who walk uprightly. As we seek that relationship, be ready for a, for a blessing from God. It may not always be, again, the way that we interpret the word blessing, um, but when we're in that sweet spot with God, when we're dwelling with him, it's going to be a beautiful thing that's going to, again, cause us to fall deeper and deeper in love with God. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, we come before you. We're grateful for this time. Uh, I just pray that you'd bless those who are unable to be at the outdoor service today, God, if there's vacations or, or sickness or um, whatever, God. We just pray a deep blessing over this uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church. We pray a deep and great blessing over those who are not a part of our church that are listening, God. We just pray a blessing over your people. We pray, God, that we would seek deep relationship with you. We thank you, God, so much for dwelling in us. We pray that we would seek your face this week, uh, that we would find ways of telling you and showing you how much we love you, God. Dwell with us, Father God. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Hope you all have a great week. Continue reading in your Psalms this week. Psalm 91 to 100. Blessings on your week.